Monty Williams said it at Phoenix Suns Media Day. DeAndre Ayton would surely like it. Is this the year that DA becomes an all-star? On today's episode of Locked On Suns, I'll give you three bold predictions for this Phoenix Suns season, starting with DA for all-star. Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past six seasons and a writer at Suns.com and Dime Magazine. Thank you all for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on day one of... NBA week, the start of the season week, I don't care what you call it, it is time, Suns basketball is back, the NBA is back, and uh, I couldn't be more excited, so I'm thrilled you guys are joining me, happy Monday, welcome to this week, hit subscribe or follow if you have not already, right down below, hit the bell if you're on YouTube, make sure you get a notification every time a new episode goes live, we are here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for you. From now until the end of free agency next year. Can you even think that far ahead? We will be there no matter what. So, a lot to get to. I want to get these three bold predictions out, but uh, I want to explain my case because you're going to uh, you're gonna take this to the bank. You're going to hold me to this throughout the whole season, and I want to make sure that you get it. So, I have some details here. Again, hit follow, hit subscribe. You can follow at LockedOnPHXSuns. But number one... Number one on my three bold predictions for the upcoming Phoenix Suns season today is, or this year is that DeAndre will be an all-star. Let me make the case. Now, there's basically three sort of groups of thought here. One is just the numbers part of it, the voting part of it, right? So last season, you might have forgotten this, DeAndre Ayton got... 600,000 plus fan votes. So he was in the top 10. You look at the the final tally for the front court, he finished in the top 10. Was he close to breaking through the top five or three? No. Nikola Jokic has a whole country behind him. You know, these guys, Anthony Davis is a Laker. We know all this, LeBron, everything else. But that's a good sign. It's a step in the right direction. That's almost, you know, it's close to a million votes. And then the other part of this, if you really zoom out and you're just getting like the lay of the land here, if you are really going to bet this, let's say, uh, between Rudy Gobert, Draymond Green, Marcus Gasol, there's been plenty of that sort of like boring big man all-star in the past, right? I don't think DeAndre Ayton's game is boring. I would say Marcus Gasol's game is more boring. Rudy Gobert's game is more boring, but you get my point. Guys who are not flashy 30 point per game scorers but they're good two-way bigs on winning teams that's actually been a blueprint to get into the all-star game in the past so it's not as crazy as it might sound and then if you think about it too we'll get into this in a minute a lot of those guys if not all I mean Gasol's out of the league the other two are fading away in terms of their all-star candidacy so there's precedent for this and there's an opening there. The other part, the other like bucket of argument that I, I feel like I have to make here is his production, DA's production, because he had 17 and 10 last year, 17 points, 10 rebounds. And if you're making the case that, that DA is going to make the all-star team, he probably has to go a little bit higher than that. But what happens if he gets to, let's say 20 and 12? Those are pretty incredible numbers. That's you know, way more points than Gobert ever scores. You're getting there in terms of rebounding. 12 is, you know, you're getting toward the top of the NBA, whereas 10 is it's kind of what's expected for a, a big-time starting center. So rebounding's always been an area that Aiton could do more in. And if you also are just, I think he can do that. I think he'll get the opportunities. That's only three more points, two more rebounds per game. A big part of why, though, is Aside from his talent and the opportunities he might get this season, he only played 29 and a half minutes per game last season. He, he's been a guy because the Suns have almost always had great backup centers. And last year, they 
had a lot of games that they were winning at the end. I'm not saying he sat out entire fourth quarters, but you know, a couple minutes here and there when the game is in hand goes a long way when you're adding up over the course of the season. So if he's out there more, then you're going to get more box score stats, counting stats, and those are going to help you in terms of your all-star numbers. So I just think all of that leads me to believe that there's just this, it's sitting there for him in a way that even if you don't think he's going to become, you know, this whole new player, which I don't necessarily know about that. I think there's going to be some give and take about his development offensively this year. I think he'll get some more opportunity. I don't know if it's quite as consistent as other people seem to think, but they're also losing the the other part of this. They're losing their backup center in JaVale McGee. And prior to that, you know, it was Rashawn Holmes or it was Dario Saric. Again, they've Aaron Baines. They've always had these good backup centers. And even last year and the year before when the Suns have really been a great team, it was McGee and it was Sharich who both were some of the best backup players overall, just like reserve bench players in the whole league. So all of that is the opportunity part. And then I think there's somewhat of like the ballot working part of this, right? Like if if you're a voter and the starters are, are a lot of the fan vote is, is how the starters get in, but the rest of it is media. And so if I'm a media member that has a vote, you know, I'm looking at Chris Paul and Devin Booker as the Suns all-stars, right? And so that's another, the last kind of bucket here is, do you, if you're looking forward into this season, you probably don't think the Suns are going to have three all-stars. I don't. That's not why I think Aiton will get in. But I do think Chris Paul is going to play fewer minutes. I think he's going to dominate the ball a little bit less. And I also think the Suns might be, this is another thing that hasn't gotten talked about a ton, is it's almost impossible for the Suns to be as good in the clutch as they were last year, which was a big part of the narrative case around Chris Paul, not only uh, two seasons ago when he was getting MVP votes, but last year in terms of his all-star and all-NBA cases. You know, being this guy who took over games at the end really helped him. And if you think which I do, it's just they were one of the most historically great clutch teams ever last year. Like you to to bet on that happening again is just unlikely. So that happens. Chris Paul gets a little bit less scoring and, you know, dominating of the ball. And he's not seen as like the end all be all for the Suns. Then you could see him not being an all-star this season. And also, of course, there's always, you know, he's going to miss some time here and there with injury. Last year, it happened to be after the All-Star break or going into the All-Star break this year. It could be that uh, it happens before and then you're looking at missed games. I don't want that to happen, but it's part of what might play out. Booker's a lock. If the Suns are a top seed again and dominant, um, though, the Suns might get two guys. Like, Booker is going to get in. The Suns could be... 500 at the All-Star break. And as we'll talk about later with another one of my predictions, I I still think Booker's almost a lock outside of obviously getting hurt to be an All-Star. But if the Suns are a top seed again, then Booker's one of their guys, but they're probably going to have a case to get two. And if, if, if you think like I do, that Paul's going to have a little bit of a quieter season, the opening is there for Aiton. Let's rifle through... The actual guys, though, as well. Those are the three buckets in terms of what eight in season will look like, but obviously you don't make the all-star team in a vacuum. There's eight openings in the West. Three front court starters, three front court reserves, two wild cards. Okay, and obviously the other guys involved here make a big difference too. I think LeBron and Jokic are, are, are locks. And I actually think Kawhi is, is going to be the other starter if he's healthy because... He plays in LA. There is a fan base there. He has a lot of guys who, you know, casual fans know who he is. They respect his game. The Clippers are going to be good, in my opinion, this year. Very, very good, potentially, and and another high seed. So he'll get the bump from winning. As long as he plays a reasonable amount of games and looks mostly like himself, I think those are going to be the three starters. So that leaves Aiton, plus the, the two guys that I mentioned, Gobert and Draymond. Last year's starter, Andrew Wiggins. And then I threw Towns, AD, and Paul George in there. Okay, so those 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys are competing for three front court reserve spots and two wild card spots. So to me, if I'm planning this out, I think Draymond is out. I think the Warriors would have to be very, very, very good in the regular season for him to be an all-star. His game just doesn't pop in that way. I think Gobert will actually take a step back in terms of his candidacy for an all-star type of appearance because of Cat. With the Jazz, it was pretty obvious that Gobert had this incredible value. I think Gobert will, f- will start to feel like the third banana. And if the Wolves aren't quite as good as the Jazz have been, you're just starting to run out of reasons why Gobert deserves this shoe-in like he's been getting for a little while. So that leaves Davis, Wiggins, Paul George, and Ayton competing for three front court reserve spots and two potential wild card spots. Now those wild card spots can go to guards, so it's not quite five spots, but it's at least three. And if everything plays out like I'm predicting, which of course it won't go exactly this way, but I think it's pretty reasonable. You're talking about those four guys, Davis, Wiggins, George, and Ayton. And I don't even know if Paul George is going to be considered a forward necessarily for three front court reserve spots. That feels pretty darn good. Maybe Towns is is another one in there. So maybe that's five guys for three spots. But if you think Ayton is going to take steps forward in terms of his production and his minutes and his role in terms of the hierarchy of this team, I think Ayton has a very, very good choice. And he had a nice start last year being in that fan vote top 10 and already having presence in voters' minds. So DeAndre Ayton will be an all-star. There we go. I bet you didn't expect that. I'm not the guy who's usually pumping up Ayton, but I really see it. Bold prediction number two coming up first. Today's show, guys, brought to you by Rocket Money. And I I was thinking about this recently because the baseball playoffs have just been sucking up my attention. I became a Padres fan, and I don't normally like baseball. And I was thinking back, this year I finally went out and got a subscription to uh, MLB TV toward the end of the season because I was so excited about the Padres. But in the past, that subscription uh, had been there and it actually charged me over like $150 one season back when I still was suffering as a Diamondbacks fan. And there's nothing worse than that feeling of getting charged for something that not only uh, is overly expensive or that you don't even want anymore, but it can just hit home when it's something that you uh, once cared for so deeply. So Rocket Money can find subscriptions for you. It can cut that entire problem right out of your life. You may even find out you've been double charged for things or charge multiple times in a month or charge too many times in a year. Rocket Money keeps track of all of it. So cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash locked on. Seriously, guys, it could save you hundreds of dollars per year. Like I just said, I, that was one subscription that was already over $100 for me with MLB TV, and they will keep track, they will prompt you to, to cancel, and they will take care of the cancellations for you. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on. All right, let's keep it rolling here. So Phoenix Suns prediction number two. Phoenix Suns bold prediction number two. I can't forget the boldness of it. Um, The Suns will get a playoff rotation player back for Jay Crowder. All right. You know, I think the Jay Crowder thing, I can understand if you're a little bit tired of hearing about it. I, I wouldn't blame you. But it's a big, big, big factor in the Suns' fortunes right now. Like, there's just no way... There's no way around that. And I think I mentioned last week it will, I, I think I said it, it'll go a long way in determining the Suns' fortunes this season. I don't want to say it'll make or break their season because I'm the type of person that thinks DeAndre Ayton, Devin Booker, Mikhail Bridges, and Chris Paul, those four guys are going to make or break the Suns' season. I really have a hard time telling you that, you know, Jay Crowder or whatever they get back is, is going to determine everything. But the more that I look at it, as much as I do think it matters, I feel pretty optimistic about it from a Sun standpoint. I think they will get somebody back who makes the playoff rotation, and obviously that would be a good thing. You know, I don't know. I'm not saying they'll be amazing or that they'll win games for the Suns, but finding a player at this point who even cracks that playoff rotation would be a pretty big win, you know? 
The Suns' playoff rotation right now is Chris Paul, campaign, Devin Booker, Landry Shamit, Mikael Bridges, Damian Lee, Cam Johnson, Torrey Craig, and then DeAndre Ayton, and they have like three more centers after that. Landale, Sharich, Biombo. So they need an upgrade on that rotation pretty badly, and you really are feeling the hole with Crowder not being there. So just to review, the team's still in the running for Crowder as far as we've heard, but this is by no means the only thing that I could see happening. But you have Atlanta, Boston, Miami, and Milwaukee. I feel like those are the four we've heard most consistently now. Depending on what you're reading or what you're listening to, some of those teams are more interested than others. Some of those teams might have had interest at one point. Now they don't. I don't know where this ultimately goes, but if I'm looking at those four teams, that's part of why I feel pretty optimistic because just like a quick scan of that, you have Justin Holiday from the Hawks, Grant Williams from Boston, Duncan Robinson from the Heat, Pat Connaughton from the Bucks. Those are like worst case scenario players. I'm not even talking about Derek White or Victor Oladipo or, I mean, Bogdan Bogdanovich from the Hawks, right? Like I'm not even going there, but even just kind of the worst case or like most compromised version of trades with those teams, you're going to get a player who you feel pretty good rolling out there in a playoff series, not to mention rebuilding teams who might trade for Crowder and then just cut him like you have uh, Jordan Clarkson, obviously, from Utah, who I've been mentioning, I feel like, for weeks, months. You have Kenyon Martin Jr., who the Suns are reportedly interested in from the Rockets. If they were to get involved and, and cut Crowder so he or buy him out, basically, so he could go pick a team to join, those guys would help the Suns. I just feel like as long as the Suns can get someone back for Crowder who can contribute and improve their roster, they'll remain in that upper tier of the championship mix. And I think they're smart to hold out for that because, again, I think just scanning the options here, you feel pretty good about what's out there. And I think there's enough of a market of playoff teams that need forward help or wing help, whatever you think of Crowder as, that I think the Suns should be able to land the plane here. And assuming they can stay healthy enough to be patient on this whole situation, they should be able to take advantage of other teams getting hurt. They should be able to take advantage of other teams underperforming, somebody mixing it up, wanting to shuffle the deck. I even think of, I know, you know, teams are, I guess the reporting out there is that other teams across the NBA don't expect the Suns to trade Crowder to another Western Conference team per se, but you know, I even look at that with a little bit of skepticism. I think of a team like Portland and they have Josh Hart sitting there. They probably have pretty high hopes for this season. I know Damian Lillard wants to stay there, but they they made a big push again, right? They got Jeremy Grant, they 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 spent some money again, even though they were really bad last year, and You could imagine a team like that going and getting a veteran like Crowder. So I think there's just enough out there. And I think the Suns are performatively looking like they're going to be patient. So again, bold prediction number two, Phoenix Suns will get a playoff caliber player back for Jay Crowder at some point in the next few months, I'll say. I don't think it even lasts until the trade deadline. All right, on to bold prediction number three for the upcoming Phoenix Suns season has to do with the backcourt, the superstars on this team. We'll get into that in one second. First today's show, guys, brought to you by Bet Online, which is your number one source all fall long for football odds. Football everything. They have articles, analysis, team news, podcasts even, everything. And as always, Bet Online also remains your continued source for all sports wagering info with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. They just sent us over regular season player props for the entire NBA. So that's points per game, assists per game, rebounds per game for all of the big players on every single NBA team. Coincidentally, we're about to get into this. Points per game for Devin Booker. Over under at bet online is 26.5. So not only do they have win total odds, not only do they have playoff, finals, MVP, awards odds, but they have statistical over and unders for every major player on every single team in the league. 
over at betonline.net. Head to betonline.net or use their mobile app to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, let's hit it. Bold prediction number three for the upcoming Phoenix Sun season is Booker's overall production offensively, his involvement rate is what I'll call it, overtakes Chris Paul's. Now, here's what I mean. To get very specific, Booker's assist percentage and usage rate, assist rate and usage rate will overtake Chris Paul's. That's a good way because usage, it's a good shorthand because usage is point, is, is, sorry, shooting possessions and turnover possessions for a player. What percentage of their time on the floor do they use by shooting or turning the ball over, right? Ending a possession, basically, right? And then assist percentage is exactly what it sounds like. How many time, what proportion of the time when they're out on the court do, they create an assist for a teammate. So if you combine those two things, assist rate plus plus usage rate, you're getting at what I just called involvement rate, which I think is a pretty good, again, shorthand for what this is. So last season, Booker was at 52.4. He had 22.4 assist rate, 32.0 usage rate. Chris Paul was at 64.2. So this is a pretty big difference. Paul exceeded Booker last year by quite a bit. So this is a pretty bold take. It might not feel like it. You're probably in your head thinking Booker already does that, right? Like we have this idea Booker's kind of the alpha and the omega for this team in a way because he scores so much. But Chris Paul's assist rate was really what did it in for him. He had a 44.5% assist rate and a 19.7% usage rate. Again, adding up to 64.2. So Here's the case for Booker to exceed Paul this year. I got into it a little bit with the Aiton stuff. I think with the current roster, I think Book will likely play make way more this season in the half court. Now, maybe I'll feel differently if they were to get a guard back, a difference-making guard back in one of these Crowder trades. Like if, the, if they're getting somebody like Jordan Clarkson back or Derek White on the high end of that, even like a Victor Oladipo in January when he's eligible to be traded and the Heat maybe wanted to do that deal. But right now, assuming the roster looks mostly the same, Booker will be more of a playmaker in the half court this season because I think Paul will be less of one. I also think having Cam in the starting lineup should take some scoring opportunities away from everybody. But I have a hard time believing that Booker won't still find a way to get the same amount of scoring as he has, right? Like, are are the Suns really going to funnel scoring opportunities away from Book toward Cam? I, I don't think so, but maybe that happens with Chris Paul. I think the bigger case, though, more than anything, is Chris Paul decreasing. It's less so Booker increasing, and it's more so, maybe a little, I could see Booker's assist rate going a little bit up. I could see his usage rate. I mean, it's probably not going up more than like 1%, but it's more so Chris Paul going down with both. I think this year, if you've listened to this show, you know, we'll start to see, starting this season, CP evolve into more of a floor spacer and ball mover as we've seen with guys like Jason Kidd, John Stockton at this point in their careers. And that's not to say that I think Paul is, you know, Paul is not fallen off the way that like Dallas Mavericks championship year Jason Kidd did or anything like that. Okay, I'm not saying that, but in order to preserve the other parts of his game that he does still have in terms of being able to create shots from the mid range and, you know, push the pace and, you know, junk up the game the way that he does, play defense on certain matchups, etc. I think he has to do a little bit less. I think he has to play a little bit more like Kidd and Stockton. And then I think some of his assists might go a little bit more toward Booker, a little bit more toward Bridges even. And then his usage, like I said, I think it's everybody else. I think all of the other four starters are looking like they will be shooting more this season. Bridges, Johnson, Booker, and Ayton, all I could see going up a little bit in usage. Um, you know, maybe book less so, but the rest of those three guys, and I think 
Paul is the logical candidate to be the one who goes down. So his usage was about 20 last year, which if you think 20%, that's one fifth. That's what everybody in theory should have on a basketball court, right? There's five guys. If everybody shot the same amount, if everybody used the same amount of possessions, then everybody would have a 20% usage rate. So what you're talking about, if you're th thinking like I'm saying, Chris Paul is going to have his usage go down is he's going to start to be like an under below average level of, in, of, of usage, a below average level of shots. That, that feels crazy to say about Chris Paul, but again, he's 37 or he, yeah, I think he's turning 37 this year or he just turned 30. This, this is unprecedented territory outside of guys like Kidd and Stockton and Steve Nash. But at that point, that's what they started to do. They started to be guys who took more threes, who assisted primarily all they were doing on the floor was moving the ball. Not moving the ball like we think of Cam Johnson being a ball mover, but a ball mover like I'm going to initiate the offense and then go space the floor and kind of get out of the way, you know? And I think that is what we will see this season by Chris Paul. But I wanted to get into the book side to close it out here because there's the Chris Paul side of his evolution to sort of a different type of player. But if Booker does this, and overtakes Paul. Let's say Booker gets to about, yeah, 30% assist, 28% assist, and let's say 33, 30, let's say 34% usage. All right, that's 62. Let's say Chris Paul's usage comes down four points and then that's how Book overtakes him. If this all happens, you're talking about a season where Book is probably pushing 30 points per game in year eight. It's a little bit late for some players, but you have to remember Booker was 19. But still, even like guys like Kobe or T-Mac, T-Mac scored 30 points per game in year six. He was also a teenager when he came into the NBA. Kobe hit it in year seven, obviously also a teenager. So players who are as good and great, we can say, as Booker at the two guard spot tend to have these 30 point per game seasons at some point. Obviously, Jordan had him like right away, right? Game was a little different back then and his team sucked when he first came into the NBA. But this this has precedent. What, what has less precedent though is players in NBA history who've had 35 and five seasons. And Booker was basically right there with the five and five last year. He's a little bit below with the assists, but like I said, I expect that to him to surpass that pretty easily this year. 30 is probably the hardest part to get to, but he was at 26.8 last year. And I'm going over, like I said on the Bet Online uh, read, 35 and 5. Only 25 players in league history have done that. And aside from Bradley Beal, I believe he did it one of the COVID seasons, they're all in the Hall of Fame. All right? We're talking about, you know, everybody from Bernard King to James Harden, to Russell Westbrook, to Michael Jordan. So, uncharted territory, I mean, relatively speaking, like pretty high caliber company. And he's on his way there. Like it wouldn't surprise anybody, but it's still worth taking a step back and just sort of recognizing where he's getting to because I think he'll still keep getting better. I think there's more he can be doing on the floor as I just laid out. But what you start to get to, if that all happens, is genuinely historic levels of production. So prepare for more Booker MVP votes. Again, prepare for a shoe-in all-star berth. He should be all NBA this year. We are in the prime of a superstar Hall of Fame caliber career. And those guys tend to keep pushing the boundaries of greatness every season right? They do that. They, they, they impress us and surprise us in new ways every season. They don't just stay at this static level because, okay, I'm great. And this is what I am as a player. No. Efficiency, a few more points, a few more assists or rebounds, taking up possessions and opportunities when other guys on your team get hurt or get worse or get older. Booker should be able to do that this year in conjunction with what I think is going to be a little bit of a step back from Paul, but that's natural. 
Booker's ready for it, and I think he'll get there. That'll close us out. Three bold predictions for this Phoenix Suns season. I hope you guys enjoyed those. We'll have more season preview coverage throughout the week. We'll have final record predictions and seeding predictions and all of that, hopefully with Aaron Edwards later in the week. And then Wednesday night is game one, opening night. I will be there. I'm sure many of you will be there. It should be a blast. Hit subscribe, hit follow. Keep it right here. Let's have some fun. Let's enjoy this. It's been a long time. We had a long break between basketball games and I could not be more ready. In the meantime, make Locked On NBA your second listen here on this Monday to catch up on everything else. Get ready for all the other NBA action around the league.